Amen. Amen. I praise the Lord today. Praise the Lord. FIBC, it is praying time. We praise God for the opportunity to come before him in prayer, to make my request, request and praise due to him. Our prayer focus today is as follows. We like to pray in our fasting focus for the U.S. Senate and to pass the gun control legislation this year. We'd also would like to pray for the body of Christ at large, FIBC and its leadership. We like to pray for Phoenix, Arizona and community. Praying for United States government and all the leadership there, our families, and last but not least, Pastor Stewart, Pastor Karen and their family. I'm gonna open in prayer that I'm gonna give out some assignments to those that are here to help along as we pray and call upon the name of the Lord for his guidance and wisdom. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we come before you this morning, oh God, thank you for your time of praise and worship that we can come before you. You bid us to come boldly through the throne of grace, and we say thank you, God. What a mighty God we serve for such a time as this. I say thank you, oh God. Well, whatever all is going on in our world, our communities, from Buffalo right on down to Texas, oh God. Comfort them right now, for some of them are still going through funeral arrangements, some funerals are today. Father, comfort the family members, the classrooms, the teachers, the husbands, for all that transition of each of those states, oh God. Father, be with them. Continue to be a blessing to us, through us and in spite of us, as we learn to listen and follow your word. Father, your word said you will guide us with your eyes. You will hide us in the cleft of the rock. So we thank you, we praise you, and we glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Humbly bow your will and your way. Amen, amen, and amen. Praise the Lord. We thank you as we begin to open in prayer. And I'm going to give out some assignments, and we're just going to flow right through. I will close out in prayer. Or Pastor Cameron can I'll close out in prayer, Pastor Stewart and the family. Um, let's see. Sister, I see Sister Carol, are you available? Heavenly Father, we come into your presence grateful, Father, that you have welcomed us to come. Not only welcome you to bait, you have made us to come and bring all of our cares and our concerns to you. We're grateful for that, Father. But our concerns are many and deep and great for the body of Christ, Lord. We are concerned, Lord, that we are not we're not letting our light shine as you have commanded us to do. We're, we're letting you down, Lord. Mm -hmm. We feel we're letting you down, Heavenly Father. All over the world, Lord, if we who are called by your name would humble ourselves and turn from our wicked ways and pray, Lord, you promise that you would heal our land. And Lord, we're going each our own way. We're going each our own way. Your word tells us that your sheep know your voice. And Lord, it seems as if we have either forgotten your voice or ignoring your voice. Lord, please call back your people. Call back your people, Lord. I'm concerned about our faithfulness to you. We're listening to all other voices. We're following other voices, Lord. So that's my concern for us, that we be faithful to you as you have been faithful to us. Well, we, we're grateful for your patience. We're grateful for your patience, Lord, but we know that eventually your patience will run out. So, Lord, we're asking you to touch our spirits, Lord. Touch our spirits, those of us who are called by your name. Touch us, Lord, that we would show the love that you have ordered us to show to each other, to you first, to each other, and then to all others that we come in contact with. Help us, Lord, be that light that you call us to be. 
I pray, Lord, for those people who are living under the threat of death, if they even let you let people know that they are followers of yours. So I pray for all of those people, Lord, who maybe not don't have the freedom to follow you as we have here in America. So I pray for them, Lord. I pray for our leaders here in Arizona, here at our FIPC. I pray, Lord, that you would give them visions, Lord. Give them visions of what you expect them to do. And then give them the will, the will to stand up and speak, thus says the Lord. Give them the wisdom, Lord. I pray you keep them healthy physically. I keep you keep them strong mentally and spiritually. Lord, just help those members of our various congregations to be open to the leadership that you have placed here. Help us, Lord, to trust that you have placed our leaders in place, not just not our votes or that, but that. It's because of the power that you have given them. Help us to be willing followers of the people you placed over us. Thank you, Lord, again, that you have made us welcome to bring our prayers and concerns to you. So my prayer, Lord, is that us, your children, your church, will stand in this time in this time where we are so needed, so many other voices are speaking, so many other lights are shining. But we know that you have told us that you have overcome the world and that if you've overcome the world, so have we. Just stand fearlessly in your power. Help us, Lord. I pray and ask all of this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, God, we do praise you always for the opportunity that we have to come before your throne of grace. And I come specifically, God, praying for uh, Phoenix and uh, our surrounding community. Uh, God, you know what Phoenix needs. You know the challenges that Phoenix faces. You know what your people need. And God, we are thankful that not only do you see and know our needs, but we are thankful, God, that you are able to supply our needs according to your riches in glory. Uh, God, we, I was listening to the news and I heard of a man who was shot uh, on the freeway and then his car uh, uh, ran off of the freeway. So there's, there are families that are mourning today. God, as we have been lifting up families in um, Texas and lifting up families in New York, um, God, we realized that in the midst of all that was happening there, there were still murders and killings and drug overdoses and heart attacks and um, other kinds of COVID-19, all sorts of things happening right here in our own neighborhood. So God, uh, as you are looking down on these other places that we lift up before you, we ask you to stop by Phoenix and mm -hmm. our communities, God, yes, that God. you would make a difference in our communities as well, God. There are still needs. There's still homelessness. There's still somebody going hungry. There's still somebody who needs health care. God, there's still so many needs right here in our neighborhood. So we pray now, God, that you would... Um, just make a difference uh, in the lives of every Phoenician. Uh, God, you know, and we thank you. We lift up our mayor. We lift up our city council before you. We lift up uh, every school board member. Uh, God, we, start, we are now seeing um, posters going up for people who are running for elected office. God, I pray not only for those running for office, that they would have a heart for your people, God, that they would put of their constituency first and not them, their own selves and not their political party first, but God, that you would help them to see the needs of the people that you are uh, raising them up to serve. And then God, I pray for us, the constituency, we can't make a difference, God, if we don't uh, lift up our voice in the ballot box. So God, as people are beginning to prepare to run for office and are soliciting our vote, I pray, God, that you help us, those who will be casting our votes, to be um, 
uh, informed and informed electorate that we would know about these people that are running for office, that we would know about the offices that are available, that we would know about judges and everyone else who's running. God, that that you would help us to make the right decisions so that your people would be the beneficiary of those who are elected to office. Uh, God, for every church in this Phoenix area that is ministering to the needs of the people, God, I pray that you give every pastor, uh, every pastor, God, that you would give them stamina to run this race. God, we know um, that there is a lot going on in our own community and God, that you would help to give them wisdom and understanding and supernatural knowledge as we uh, support them as they endeavor to lead us as you have given them the ability to do so. Uh, God, I thank you because I know I have not prayed this prayer in vain, but that you hear it and not only do you hear it, but that you respond. You say the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. And so I know that these prayers will come to pass. We thank you, God, and we praise you for who you are, for what you're doing, and what you will do in and amongst your people. We thank you, God, and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Karen. Our next prayer time will be United States government. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come in the name of Jesus. You told us that, Father God, we could call on your name. You also told us that where two or three are gathered together, there you would be in the midst. So Father God, we have heard prayers going up to you today and we know that you have heard them. So Lord, we are continuing to pray. We've already prayed, Lord, Lord, for our leaders. We prayed for Phoenix and for the state of Arizona. Now we're lifting up to you, Lord God, this United States government and all of those people who are in leadership positions right now. We lift them all up to you, Lord God, though we don't know every name, we know that you do. And we are lifting them up to you right now, asking, Father God, that you will center them according to your will, your word, and your way. They were called and they were elected for a purpose. And Father, we know that all power, all strength, all knowledge, all come from you. So we are asking, Lord God, that those who are in those positions will humble themselves as you have told all of us to do. Let them, Father God, not take their positions for granted. Let them not assume that they are in charge, that they can do whatever they want to do. Lord God, we pray that you will fill them with your grace, your mercy. Fill them with the knowledge that they need to fulfill this position. We pray, Lord God, that they will not seek fame for themselves or that they will make decisions that will benefit them and their constituents only. We pray, Lord God, that they will have a mind and a body and a spirit that praises you, lifts you up, and that they will be obedient to you. But we know, Father God, you've told us, if we ask, you will give. So if they ask, Lord God, to make right decisions, if they pray, Lord God, if they humble themselves, if they seek your face diligently, not just in word, but if they will mean it. And we pray, Father God, that they will not take their leadership positions for granted, and that let them remember that they are there to help the people. We pray now, Lord God, as they focus on what's next, that they will listen to you and that they will pray and ask for your guidance and for your direction. For you know what this nation needs, Lord God. And we elect people and we pray that before we go to the ballot, Lord God, to the polls to vote, that we will have already prayed that we will lift up each person, Father God, that we will do some checking and we will listen to you. We don't want to get the names of people who are just popular. We don't want the ones who have the most money. We want those, Lord God, whose hearts are stayed on Jesus, those who are obedient. We don't always know them, 
by what they say, but you do. So we are counting on you, Father God. We're asking, Father God, that you will give us uncommon knowledge, that you will give us what people are called feelings, that the Lord will know what he's saying to us. We pray that our ears will be open to hear, Father God, and that we will not be persuaded by anything other than you believe this is the right person. So we pray, Lord God, for voters. We pray for those who are elected, those who are running, those who are thinking about running. And we pray, Lord God, that you will weed them out and that we will know that you have heard our prayers. In Christ Jesus' name, we lift this all up to you and we say amen and thank you for what you're doing already. In Christ Jesus' name, we humbly submit this prayer to you. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today thanking you. Thanking you for allowing us to be here. Thanking you, dear Heavenly Father, for all that you've done and the blessings that you've bestowed upon us. Dear Heavenly Father, we're asking a special blessing for the families, our church family, our leadership, Pastor Stewart and his family. Watch over each and every one of them, please, and take care of them. You know their situations, and you know that the devil is there. And we ask that you shield them and protect them, guide them, give them the knowledge that they need to be the leadership that FIBC needs. Dear Heavenly Father, bless the children, shield them, and help them as they go along the way and understanding. Bless each of the ministries that are under the leadership of Pastor Stewart and Pastor Karen and the ministries that are there, that they understand the future that we are headed in and that we trust them and that we pray for them and understand what they're going through. We know that it's hard to be a leader and everything that you do is not always welcome. We ask that you give them the strength, the guidance, and the help that they need to guide us through this year. In thy son Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, praise the Lord. And I'm gonna close our, our last one out of praying for Pastor Stewart, Pastor Karen and their family. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to come before your presence of prayer. We humbly bow with your will and your way, oh God, that you will just have your way and we'll submit. Rather, we understand where it's going and not, Lord, we'll say yes, Lord, to your will and to your way. And guiding, and we ask, oh God, that you just continue on, Lord, and moving him forward as the leader of FIBC. Father, we ask for his help, mate, Pastor Karen, Lord, not just uh, our first lady, Lord, but the helper of him, Lord. Father, unity of side by side, not head or back, but side by side, working together in ministry. That their, their most might be built up in the most holy faith. So we thank you for them, oh God. We thank you, Lord, and ask bless upon their children, oh God. For though they're the next generation falling behind them in ministry. Things of the world, the future are forerunners, oh God, coming behind them, oh God as they watch them walk the walk of faith. And we thank you, oh God, and we praise you, and we glorify you, God. For, Lord, this is all about you. We thank you, God. We ask for continued wisdom of them, oh God, that you will guide them with your eyes. You will have them in the cleft of the rock. You didn't say this walk would be easy, but you did prepare them and equip them to walk it. So we thank you for them. Bless them in the name of Jesus. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Humble about your will and your way. Amen, amen, and amen. Praise God. Thank you. We thank all of you. We have a few more minutes before we pass it over to Pastor Stewart. But we thank you for your prayer time. We just continue to cover us in prayer, each one of us, nationally, globally, and civically, wherever your family members are at. We'll continue to pray for them as well and be a lifter of the heads of those that may be mental health, physically, mentally, emotionally. We talk about destitute, the ones in the street, our homeless people that's in the street, our children. Even the ones that's going through right now, their friends are being buried this week from Baltimore to Texas. So continue to lift them up as we continue to give it over to the Lord. We thank you. We praise you for this time. Pastor Stewart, are you ready?
prayer time today. I want to read a letter that Dr. Carolyn Watson, our Minister of Pastoral Counseling, sent today to the staff. It goes along with some of our prayers about the gun violence. June 1, 2022, dear staff, as we are already, as we are all sadly aware of the numerous deaths and injuries that are caused by gun violence, please see several information websites that you or someone you might be interested in as our nation approaches Gun Violence Awareness Weekend 2022. This three-day event starts Friday, June the 3rd through Sunday, June the 5th. 2022. Participants in various events have been asked to wear the color orange, which represents the color that is usually worn so others can see you in a potentially dangerous situation. Even if you will not be attending an event, you can simply wear or display something orange to show your personal awareness of gun violence. We continue to be saddened by the loss of 19 school-aged children and their teachers who were brutally slain in Uvalde, Texas. With continued prayer and vigilance, we keep their families and survivors in our prayers. The families who lost dear ones in Buffalo, New York also remain close to our hearts. Stay vigilant in prayer and love for one another. There are upwards to 100 people who are killed each day in the United States by gun encounters. Wear orange, wear Christ, be Christ-like. Dr. Carolyn Watson, Minister of Pastoral Counseling, FIBC. Uh, not only that, I was reading an article, I think yesterday in the newspaper, and it said that the two groups of people who are killed most by gun violence are black males and older white males. The black males, of course, are killed due to gun violence in the streets. The white older males uh, are, are due to uh, suicide. Uh, so out of all the people who are killed by gun violence, of course, we hear about the mass shootings and those happen periodically, too, too regularly. But the, the killings of, by gun violence, the, the most people killed by gun violence every week are black males and older white males. I thought you might be helpful to have that kind of information. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we, we'll probably need the extra six minutes for our Bible study. Others will be joining us. Uh, we uh, took a pause last week because of the pain and the mourning and the grief that we were experiencing relative to the second mass shooting in two weeks, that was the shooting in, in uh, Uvalde, Texas. So we, are, we have to catch up on our study of worship. So what we're gonna do, Pastor Karen, I don't know if you are listening, I believe you are, but I'm gonna ask you to play the video of Dr. Evans in a moment or two, so that we might get back on track on our study dealing with worship. Again, we are studying worship uh, this today. We, we may be able to finish the lesson today. And uh, one of the key points that Dr. Evans said in his book was worshiping by faith requires believing in God, knowing God, and adjusting our expectations to his. Authentic worship displays an honest faith and trust in God. Are you giving God your leftovers or are you giving him the very best you have to offer? Um, we did a video, I mean, we did a survey on where we thought we were in giving God authentic worship rather than a facade, and we talked about that. We talked about cultural Christianity, which is me-focused, self-centered. Uh, we talked about authentic worship and that we could find examples of authentic worship in the Bible. Uh, we can find them in Jesus Christ, looking how he worshiped, and we can pray to the Lord for direction, instruction, 
and correction. So, uh, Pastor Karen, if you are able to play that video on worship by Dr. Tony Evans, we'll do that right now and we'll pick up where we left off two weeks ago. We're built and set up for various kinds of films and movies and TV projects. The, the person who was the guide told us that the towns we were driving through were what he called a facade. There was nothing behind what looked like completed buildings. It was only the face that gave you the impression it was a full facility, but it was a facade. It gave a look without backup of reality. When it comes to worship, a lot of people's worship is a facade. It looks authentic and real, but behind it, there is no reality. It just has the face of worship. When you come to this exhibit and I'll look at Kingdom Heroes, we want to look at how worship is to reflect mm. the life of faith that is lived by someone who really wants to be recognized in God's museum. We read in Hebrews 11, verse 4, by faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Cain and Abel were raised in the same house by the same parents. <laughs> they had the same history of their parents' sin and how the fig leaves were not enough to cover them from God's righteous demands and how God had to slay an animal in order for there to be atonement against their sin. They had the same background. They also went to the same church. They went to worship. But we're told that Abel's worship, sacrifice was accepted. Cain's was rejected. So it is possible to go to worship and have your worship rejected because it didn't meet the specifications that God required. God does not want us to worship him on our terms. He wants us to worship him on his terms. Let me define worship. Worship is the recognition of God for who he is, what he has done, and what we're trusting him to do. Sometimes it's celebration, other times it's meditation, sometimes it's reflection, sometimes it's with exuberant. It includes songs and listening to his word, but it has to be on his terms. Well, Cain and Abel approached worship differently. When you go to the doctor because something is wrong, the doctor writes a prescription to fix what's ailing you. You probably can't even understand what he wrote <laughs> because I've been to plenty of doctors and I can't understand what they write. But somehow the pharmacist can figure it out and he prescribes what the doctor has ordered to make me better. I can't make up my own prescription or else I wouldn't have needed to go to the doctor and the pharmacist wouldn't have accepted it anyway. I need the right prescription by the right person that will give me the right thing to fix what's wrong with me. The Bible says in Genesis 4, which tells the Cain and Abel story, that Abel brought the first of his flock and their fat portion. It tells us that Cain brought what he had grown from the ground. Cain brought to God what he had done based on what he could cultivate from earth. Abel brought to God what God had created and required in order to deal with sin. In other words, the reason why Cain's worship was rejected is that he didn't bring what God required and he didn't bring it at the level that God required it. Let's look at what Abel did that puts him in the status of a kingdom hero and puts him on exhibit in God's museum. 
that we should do if we want that same recognition. He gave God first. Did you know there's some things God can't do? Oh, yeah, you say God can do everything. Well, not quite. For example, God can't lie. God can't sin. God can't contradict his essential nature. Let me tell you something else God can't do. He can't be second. <laughs> Whenever you see God, he demands to be first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. He told the folks in uh, Revelation 2, you've left your first love. He tells them in Malachi 1, why do you give me leftovers? Why do you give me not what is primary, not what is first? So it is absolutely critical that God be honored for who he is. Whenever we give God what is left over, we have insulted him and we've not recognized him for who he is, what he has done, and what we are praying and believing and asking him to do. So God must be treated as first. He also brought him the best. He brought him the fat portion. He didn't bring him just anything. And he brought him what was required to deal with sin, the shedding of blood. He brought the, the sacrifice of an animal. See, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. You cannot bring to God what you want him to have and skip what he wants you to give him. He wants you to give him what he has required. It says that when Abel worshiped, he was called righteous because he met God's standard, not because he was perfect or else he wouldn't have needed a sacrifice. The Bible calls the worship of Cain in Jude verse 11, because it only has one chapter, it calls the way of Cain. Let me tell you what the way of Cain is. It's worshiping God by human reason, not worshiping God by divine revelation. In other words, God doesn't want you to make up in your own mind what worship for him looks like. He wants you to find out what he expects, what he wants, how he wants it, and adjust to that and make that the basis of your worship. As a parent, you know what that's like when you have a child who wants to make up their own rules in your house while you pay the bills. That's not too, that's not too cool if what they want is not what you're requesting or requiring. They are leaning to their own understanding. But it says the reason why Abel was in this this kingdom hero museum of God is because he gave God what God requested and what God required. Let me ask you a question. How would you feel if you went into a restaurant and they offered you leftovers? I mean, you wouldn't be there very long, right? Because you paid a price to get the best, not to get what's left. When a former president of the United States came to meet me for lunch, uh, I can guarantee you, he didn't get leftovers. He didn't get leftovers, why? Because of his position that needed to be honored. God has a position that needs to be honored, so you don't just, you don't just be casual about that because he is a great God and deserves a great worship. He told him that in Malachi 1, he says, I'm a great king. So don't give me what you've got left over when you can give the governor a, a, a higher rank than you give me. So he was righteous because he treated God like God. That's what authentic worship ought to be. That's what God is calling his people to. And then we find out something else. We find out that he still speaks. This is deep. It's something I'll mention in more detail in our last session. Now, Abel was killed by his brother Cain. But it says, even though he was killed by his brother Cain, he still speaks. Well, number one, that means when you're dead, you're not dead. That is, you're not non-existent because he still speaks. Of course, he's speaking through the story based on the word but he spoke back then in Genesis 4, but Hebrews 11 says he's still talking today. 
And one of the messages he's given to you and me is don't come to God by reason. Come to God by revelation. Find out what he wants, how he wants it, and meet him on his terms. You get his undivided attention because that means you are functioning by faith. When you do, when this becomes your modus operandi, then that means you are functioning as a kingdom hero. And that means you're working your way to getting your own statue in his museum. Why? Because he can trust you to give him the value that he deserves. All right, all right. That gives us a review to get us back in these, in the frame of mind where we were before we took the week off last time for prayer. So we begin today with another scale. It, it causes you to have to uh, be transparent and measure yourself. The question is, on another scale from one to 10, where would you rate your own worship of God compared to what he has prescribed? one being your prescription and 10 being God's inherent word. And uh, I, matter of fact, I'm not gonna ask us to share our respective answers. Just think about where you would be on a scale of one to 10 with uh, one being your own prescription for worshiping and number 10 being God's inherent word, the guidance that he gets us. Uh, so you can just keep that to yourself. Uh, hopefully, you, many of us, when we did that, were above five. Five would be average, uh, but just where you are. Um, so this question number six, identify how a greater level of authentic worship based on God's standards and not your own, can empower you to grow in your relationship with him, receive his favor, and pursue your purpose more fully. So again, he talked, to, he used, Dr. Evans used the comparison of the worship of Cain and the worship of Abel. And of course, we saw that God accepted the worship of Abel and did not accept it, accept the worship of Cain. So one of the things Dr. Evans said that God doesn't want fake worship, he wants authentic worship. And he wants worship that puts him first. So if that is the biblical measurement for worship, for authentic worship, um, how do you think authentic worship will help you to grow in your relationship with God, to receive his favor and pursue your purpose for being on the world more fully. I hope you got all of that. It's, 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 it's how does authentic worship help you to become the person God's want, God wants you to be? How does it please God and how does it help you to fulfill your purpose? Let's hear it. I will begin by sharing my answer. I said, because it is the kind of worship that the Lord receives and rewards, authentic worship. As we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, the Holy Spirit in, interacts more freely with us. So when we worship, uh, have authentic worship, it gives the Holy Spirit the opportunity to move throughout various aspects of our lives so that we can fulfill the purpose for which we have been created. That is my answer, but I wanna hear from some of you. How does authentic worship help you in your relationship with God and fulfilling your purpose? No takers, come on, come on, no takers. I know- Yes, do it. Yes, uh, for, for me, I look at it as similar to what uh, Dr. Tony Evans was saying, it makes the relationship between me and God more intimate, more so with me because now I'm giving him what he's asking for on a daily basis because I don't know how to do it all because of my sinful nature. But as I learn daily how to give him what he's asking, as I read and study, fast and pray and just listen, I'm guided more into his presence. And the word says in his presence, fullness of joy forevermore. 
So as I learn to do that in his presence, then he's more pleased with my worship. And it's not like a rogue thing following everybody else or what they're doing. But I'm now just under guidance of what he wants. And his guideline in the Bible has already told us how to worship, how to pray to him. If we follow those guidelines, then I'm more into receiving what he has for me, but more so to receive his joy of love. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Pastor Karen. Yes, ma'am. So I always think about worship uh, the way I do the song, when praises go up, blessings comes down. And I actually always think that we are singing it wrong because the truth is when praises go up, the blessed one, God comes down, says that God inhabits the praises of his people. So for me, authentic worship um, invokes God's presence with me. And I can't, you know, what a better way to have relationship than to be in the presence of the one that you are worshiping because he inhabits the praises of his people. So my relationship with him is strengthening because in my worship, I am spending real quality time just with him. And that's wherever I am worshiping with the corporate worship, individual worship. God inhabits uh, my praise just as he inhabits all of our praise, but he also inhabits my praise and he comes and he sits and, and sups with me. And that just enhances my relationship with him all the more. All right, thank you very much for that. Okay, moving forward, it reads, giving God worship does not necessarily translate into giving him authentic worship. We see this laid out in the story of Cain and Abel. Cain brought something to God based on his own experiences and interests. Abel brought what God wanted and expected. Both brought something, but God accepted one of only one of the offerings. We discovered this truth in Genesis 4, 3 through 5, which reads, Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought the firstlings, firstlings of the flock and of their fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. Cain and Abel both knew what to do, but only Abel chose to do it. Cain made a choice according to his own way of thinking. Why do you think Cain chose to give God what he did? Now, just remember that Dr. Evans brings out the belief that a blood offering was required rather than simply an offering from the ground. So Abel was a rancher. He had access to sheep. Ab uh, Cain was a farmer. He had access to producing from the ground, but when it came to giving an offering to God, a blood offering was required. So why, if, if, if that is indeed the case, that a blood offering was required in that, in that offering in Genesis 3, 4, why do you think Cain did not bring a blood offering? That's, that's the answer that we're looking for right here. Okay, need to hear of some of our biblical students. Many of us have been in the Bible a long time, so don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. There are some answers in your hearts and mind. Let me hear it. <laughs> I see you shaking your head, Sister, Sister Yvonne. <laughs> okay, come on now, I'm gonna start calling names. I'm going to start calling names. I don't get one. Mm -hmm. Why, why did Cain offer what God didn't expect? All right, Deacon Ellis, <laughs> unmute. I told you I'm going to start calling names. I'm not playing. <laughs> so, and, and, and that's fine, Pastor. Okay. What we need, what we have to understand is just by 
Cain and Abel, one being a farmer of the soil and one having sheep. We are making or taking the assumption that both of them had the same background as far as what God wanted. Now, if we assume that, yep. then uh, there was some basis for Cain doing what he did and Abel doing what he did. Mm -hmm. If Abel were to say, well, I have, I have sheep and, and uh, maybe, maybe the, the farmer didn't have any blood offer, offering to give. Nowhere when I do the research did it say that he had any animals. It only highlights in Genesis that he was a farmer of the soil. Um, they didn't say anything about him having any livestock. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, it, it's difficult to, for me to, to say what they knew, when they knew it, and what they did and why they didn't do it. But also in Genesis, and I, I thought we would uh, talk about that, is that God says he likes the fat mm -hmm. of the land. If you go into Leviticus and you go into a lot of other scriptures, the fat comes up all of the time uh, as being an offering for God, which means that it has to be, there is no fat on grass products or things of this nature. Sure. So it, it's, it's difficult to say, Pastor, exactly what they knew if we make the assumption that they, they both had the same training, uh, then uh, Cain kept his and, and didn't want to give it up. Okay, yes, and, and, and again, that's what I said. I, I said, we're making the assumption what Dr. Evans made that they both knew a blood offering was required. So if, if that assumption is true and we will use, we will speak of it as true, then the reason, I mean, a couple of reasons I would see why Cain did not did not bring a, a blood offering. First of all, the fact that he brought from his crops, he brought what was accessible and convenient. He was a farmer. So he brought what was accessible, his, his products from the ground. Another thing is that even though he may not have had any animals, his brother was a rancher. He could have purchased an animal from his brother, but he chose not to do that based on the assumption. So he was cheap. He, he did not, he did not want to spend bargain with his brother to say, I need a lamb, just like you need a lamb to offer to God. Uh, so he did not, he did not expend extra in order to bring the acceptable offering to God. I see Carmelita's hand. I'll stop and pause for you. I'm not, I'm answering the first question, Pastor Stewart, authentic worship for me, it helps me to discern right from wrong and how to treat others, no matter how they treat me. Good, good. And I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Thank you. So th does anyone else want to offer speculation? And all we can offer is speculation. None of us is in Cain's mind, but, but we, we're looking at what the Bi Bible says and looking at what Dr. Evans interpreted as Cain should have brought a blood offering. Did anybody else want to offer, I see you unmuted, uh, Evangelist Lorraine, why Cain didn't offer a blood offering? Yes, ma'am. Um, I agree with what I've heard so far, but I also was, was thinking while you were talking and praying about it, was that the scripture says, I will not offer God anything that cost me nothing. Right. And when God made the assignment, he was already aware of what was needed and how, what you'd have to do to get it. Carol and Ensis to Bertie. Okay. Yeah. And I was thinking it's a matter of the heart. I think if you have a heart for God, then you, you know what God wants and, and you have studied his words, you know, God personally, and you will give to God what he requires. So I think Cain, 
you know, he, like you said, both of them grew up in the same um, household. They knew God, but I think Cain didn't have the heart for God, the true feeling that God is all that he needs and he should be doing the work of God. So he held back because he didn't give all. Okay, thank you very much, Sister Birdie and then Deacon White. I agree totally with the last speaker, and that's what I'm saying. I, I cannot possibly believe that God would require what a person cannot provide. I right. just don't think that he's that kind of God. <laughs> and I think, I think too, that the, the last person said, it's the heart. Okay. And if, if, uh, if uh, Cain uh, was a farmer, if his heart was to give to God the best that the farm produced, that's all that God would be requiring for him. And then you have people who absolutely have nothing except a prayer of thanksgiving to give to God, a sincere prayer of thanksgiving. And I think God is satisfied. I'm, I'm just thinking for God, but I just cannot believe coming from a family that was as poor as we were and, and that God would ever have told us that since you have nothing, and I, I'm not satisfied with that. I think it's the heart that he was looking at. Thank you. Thank you. Deacon White? Well, this is just a repetition because of what Sister Carol and Sister Birdie said is what I was planning to say. Okay. Okay. That it, it is pretty much the condition of your heart and it goes along with what Brother Evans had just talked about, a facade. If your service is a facade and if it's not, if you're doing it just because, oh, well, he says I have to give something, so let me give something. And if you do it in that manner and you are not real, as uh, someone else said, God looks at the heart, motive, and intention. And those things make up an offering. All right, thank you very much. All right, the next question is, how do you feel when you see someone who claims to be a believer choosing to serve and worship God on their own terms rather than according to the scripture? Share why you think you feel the way you do. Now, this is getting into, into tricky territory because it's a matter of you judging or at least observing with not knowing what's in a person's heart so this is this is a this is a a, a tricky question because it it kind of goes it makes the assumption we know what's in a person's heart so and i'm just reading it so don't 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 shoot the message i'm just reading the question from the book so the question is again how do you feel when you see someone to, who claims to be a believer choosing to serve and worship God on their own terms rather than according to scripture? Share why you think you feel the way you do. All right, who's going to jump into that one? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, I would just take it that um, this is Sister Pittman. Yes, man, I, I see. Would, that they believe that the scriptures were wrote for them the way they were thinking how the scripture was supposed to fit them and not what God wanted the scriptures, how it was supposed to be for him, not for their way of thinking. It was supposed to be the way God was thinking. Okay. I, I, that, that, that. That's good, good for me. Someone else want to take a stab at that? Um, yes, ma'am, Sister Carla. So I learned, and then I developed the practice, and then you continue, the, I continue to practice. There but by the grace of God go I. Ah. And then you just... You live the life that God intended for you to live. Okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Like I said, this is this question really gets over into judging. Yeah, yeah. So here's a, here's a follow-up question. You Says, have a hand up, Pastor. You have a hand oh, up, oh, Dr. Uh, Tarkington. Oh, 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 all right. Sister Tarkington, yes, ma'am. Oh, I. the only way I would know that they're living on their own terms, I think would be that I would have had a discussion with them because by observation, I don't know what's going on in their life. And so I, I, 
I fear not that uh, that I be judging somebody just based on what I see and what I know. But when I talk to people who give me some rationale about why they are not, well, you know, I'm just using like a, attending church or tithing or whatever, and they tell me that, then I'm kind of questioning, okay, how is that going to differ from, <laughs> you know, from others and, and mine or anybody else's motives? But they would have to tell me that. I, I don't want to be the one who makes that assumption by observation. Okay. Let me give an example that kind of helps me do that in, in a very superficial way. Uh, it, it does cross my mind. You know, every year they release the tax um, information of the president. And the president we know he makes $400,000 a year, plus most of them have books, you know, book sales. And so it's, it's not hard for a president to make a million dollars a year, but then they also share what they give to charity. And I, I am, I, I am even, even when, when, when Barack Obama was president, he and his wife, when Biden, I, I don't, Trump, I guess he never has released it. <laughs> But but the two the, but but Biden and and Obama gave very little to charity, uh, and I, it always kind of blows my mind that they, they both say they, they, they well they are practicing Christians, but when it comes to their income, they give very and, and most of them what they give to charity is not to a church; they give to secular charity. And so that always raises a question in my mind about how much are they really committed to make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and might give $10,000 a year to, to charity and most of that not going to churches. So that's just a, a, a superficial example of something that happens every year when the presidents release their tax returns. All right. The next question, how do you think it makes God feel if you or others choose to worship him inauthentically or even worse, just for show? Again, how do you think it makes God feel if you or others choose to worship him inauthentically or even worse, just for show? Uh, it just reminds me of what my mother had taught us as children. Uh, we learned uh, it's a dangerous thing to play with God. And she said, you can play with anybody you want to play with. But she said, don't play with God. So to get up in church and play like you want to play with Miss Jeannie shouting, you and kid jump up and start playing and mother will look at you with them eyes, sit yourself down. Don't play with God. So as an adult, I still had that reverence and respect. I'm going to say healthy respect. I don't play with God. So I'm, I'm not going to give it. I give what God has given me to give. But if for show, no, it would never work. Not for me anyway, because I'm mindful. I always say it might strike me in the middle of service and have me laying down dead. So, no, I would not. Yeah, I, I know in times past, they've had done stories on televangelists who um, trick people into thinking that they were healing people they had somebody had had, had a phone in the, not a phone but a had, had an earplug and they could somebody was communicating them to somebody who might be sick or plan to be sick or you've uh, you've heard stories about them talking about how they knew how to rile up the crowd they knew how to uh uh get them to give a certain amount of money, um, et cetera. So it, 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 it makes you feel disappointed that people who claim to be religious, who claim to be Christian leaders, that they would take advantage or they would laugh at the people or would mock the people from, uh, from whom they're receiving tithes and offering, who they are helping and they laugh at them. So yeah, yeah, it's 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 terribly disappointing when you see that somebody has been inauthentic. And just remember that all of us at some point or another have times of 
of inauthentic worship, I believe, you know, I mean, uh, uh, we're not 100% 100, uh, 100 there all the time. So, yeah, yeah. Pastor, your question was, how does God feel? So right. I, <laughs> when I think of what God feels, yeah. I think it's like either one of two things are all bad, either it's a waste of your time or you're going to be punished for it. Yeah. It's like, yeah. why yeah. did you even bother to do that yeah. Yeah. if right. it wasn't authentic? So I, I would feel like, right. yeah, something's going to happen. Not good. Right. And, and he knows for sure <laughs> if we are authentic or inauthentic. He, there, there's no judging about him. He knows for sure. Rod, I see your hand up. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, what about what? Well, well, I I, I feel like uh, um, as uh, Sister Target was saying, uh, I, I feel like um, uh, God would be hurt uh, from uh, if something was insincere. Um, but then I I, I question something. What about the secrecy of giving? Um, and uh, what I mean by that, as you mentioned about the presidents and their tax statements, what about for people who give secretly and they do give, but you just don't know where they give it and how they give it and they give it to go to the glory of God, but we don't uh, know it because the scripture talks about the Bible passage in the, the gospels where it said, when you give your alms, do not give it to be seen of men. So even though the tides are being, uh, or like their statements are being shown in the taxes, uh, if somebody wanted to uh, uh, praise God with their giving and nobody, and, and they don't want people to see it and they wanna follow the line of the word. And I know we live in an age of transparency. Uh, who do we wanna be transparent to? Do we wanna be transparent to the person or do we want to be transparent to the God that created the persons? Yeah, well, today, so, you know, uh, if you follow the Daily Bread, today's devotion will talk about uh, giving in secret. And yeah. if, you give, if you give in public and let everybody know what you're doing, then you've got your reward already. But yeah. if you give secretly, so of course, uh, giving secretly, giving undercover is the best, is, is, is what God wants, it's the motive. Um, yeah, thank you. One quick question, Doc. One quick question, and, I, and I, I'll get out of your hair. Um, like when we go to, let's say we go to a grocery store and we're going to buy something. Mm -hmm. And you know, now with uh, people who have needs um, and they ask, would you like to give a dollar? And yeah. let's say you have somebody that is around you who may not be of the faith, but they know that you're of the faith and you may not give at that instance, but they don't know that you give to your church or you uh, or you took care of a neighbor. They don't see, they didn't know about that uh, because you kept that secret. Sure. Um, if you're not, like say, every time you go buy something at a local store, if you don't give a dollar, are you in trouble with God or are you well, I mean, I mean, I was sore the other day and they asked me and I said, no, I said, no, because one, I give to FIBC, I give to different charities. I've, and so, I mean, I, you know, I give to charities that I usually know that I, that, that I support. And so uh, I don't, I, I didn't feel bad when I told the lady, no, she, she said, do you want to give to this charity? I said, no, I didn't feel bad about that because I give, I give to other places. So, so yeah. All right, number two, it says, compare and contrast the two if statements in Genesis four and seven. First statement, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And I'm gonna read that in another version. Genesis four and seven. Let me read that in the New Revised Standard Version and see if that's different. Genesis four and seven. If you do well, you will, well, okay. The context was, um, okay, uh, this is after God didn't accept Cain's offering. So it says in verse five, but Cain in his offering, he had no regard for Cain is all. So Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. That is his facial expression. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, you, will you not be accepted? 
And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. It is, its desire is for you, but you must master it. So the, it says, compare and contrast the two if statements. If you do well, would not your countenance be lifted up? Second statement, if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door and its desire is for you, is for you, but you must master it. What change of outcome does God give for worship done well versus worship not done well? Uh, again, what change of outcome does God give for worship done well versus worship not done well? Let me see who'll take a shot at that one. Yes, Mr. Stewart, this is Dorothea. Yes, ma'am. So when I listen to that, I think that anytime you do good, there is a positive outcome. And when you don't do good, then there's some negative rewards. There's, po there's positive and negative outcomes for everything that we do. So whenever you do something good, you will reap the benefits. And when you don't, you will have to pay. Okay, okay. I, I think that that's just a good answer as any. Thank you for that, Dorothea. So the follow-up question is, describe how the principle found in Genesis 4, that is worshiping authentically, relates to a person's emotional state of mind. So how does authentic worship help our state of mind? Now, that's, a, that's an even deeper question. I'd like to hear somebody take a stab at that one. Yes, ma'am. I see. Yes, ma'am. What I thought of when we were reading this had to do with, I'm just going to use an example of, well, I'll, I'll just put it in the, the uh, uh, vernacular of faith of being the emotion. Uh, because, for example, in days when I was not as fortunate as I happened to be at the moment, sure, financially, sure. I guess, and I, and I had a choice between paying a bill or paying my tithe. Yes, ma'am. Question was, you know, do I have the faith to move forward and go ahead and pay the tithe and believe that that is the right thing? So emotionally, I can let go of it and not worry about my bill. Mm -hmm. Or do I hold back and think, oh, no, I got to do this because, you know, I, and I make up in my mind. God would want me to take care of this first and then whatever. But anyway, those are the, to me, that becomes the choice in one's emotion and mind. How deep is the faith that you have in your belief system that you go forward with it, even when it seems very difficult to do and, and you feel it might even cost you something. Sure, sure. Negative, yeah. Yeah, so, so I, I think I hear you saying, in answer to the question, is that, when you you do when you worship the way God wants you to worship, when, and, and in this case, it, right. it, you know, paying tithes, giving tithes, that you you had a sense of a peace of mind, right. even though you had a bill that was due. Right, right, right. So that's yeah, what I, because I believe so strongly in that sure. principle and faith sure. that somehow this is going to be taken care of. You know, sure. but anyway. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's a wonderful example. Sister Carla, yes, ma'am. Well, based on what I said earlier, and so that's my kind of guiding principle. Um, and so, you know, I always have a song in my heart, right? Or a song in my mind. Okay. So the song about I'm the old Negro spiritual, I'm too busy praising my savior. Okay. okay. So if you are doing what you are supposed to do. You're not worrying about what the other fella is or isn't doing. And you know, and I, I do believe that um, God does make us discerners of um, when it is time to say something in a Christian manner that will affect someone else and how they're doing something but pretty much like I say if you're busy doing what you're supposed to be doing then you you have a peace of mind 
you because you're not trying to worry about what they're doing or, or how they are doing it now with the tithing principle so i wasn't um i don't always feel capable to um to comment on it because of the fact for a long time i didn't i did not tie because of the fact that i was taught that that's an old testament principle and that the 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 law was fulfilled it was the law and the law was fulfilled uh with the new testament when jesus came um so i believed in the principle and followed the principle be a cheerful giver so that did not limit me in what and who i gave to um i i gave liberally so if i wanted to give to a birthday party a graduation i did not allow my hand to be tight i i gave freely okay if i wanted to i supported all of the ministries and 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 whatever at the church and uh, everything else that came along uh, uh okay revival that's, that's what i'm trying to say so when it was asked I might not have given um, an, an exorbitant amount. I might have put a dollar in. I might have been, it all depended on how the spirit led me, but I would give. So that was always my thinking. And that was always the way that I, I approached that. Um, others, um, um, so, so yes, Miles is one. But others had told me, well, you're cutting off your joy. The Lord has something better for you in store and uh, you're, you're not receiving it. And eh? okay, I thought I had a pretty good life. The only thing that I wanted was to um, have a partner, uh, to be married, to have a partner and to be in a Christian relationship. So that was my only thing. It still did not, make me tithe. Um, I do now tithe. I do now. Why are you? I do. I do. That's Amen. all I'm going to say. All right. I, do, I just tithe. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, you all thought right. I wasn't going to stop. Okay. All right. All right. Deacon Alice. <laughs> well, I, I look at this pastor from scriptures. Um, and what scriptures come to mind is the woman with the two mites. She gave all that she had. Yep. And another scripture comes to mind. And she was admonished for it and uh, for doing what she did. The woman with the alabaster oil. Mm -hmm. They said she could have done something else with it. But no, she took that oil right. and gave it to her, her savior. Those are the kinds of things that pleases yeah, God. Sure, sure, sure. So if, if any other rationalization is man-made, I could have done this or I would have done that. I'm not going to have this and I would have had that and, and, what, and what have you. But if you believe in God, then he will provide for you. And we always say it. Oh, I believe in God. He will make a way. But I ain't going to give you my last dollar. You that's, know, that's right. You know, uh, so that's that's the only thing I can really point to, because if, if you ask man, what would he do? He will always go with, I need to pay whatever, keep whatever, do whatever. Yeah. Uh, and, and in God's case, it's not necessarily like in, in mathematics, that if then type of relationship. If I give this, then I will get that. No, you have to give on faith and whether or not he gives you anything or not yeah. is really a left up to him yeah. Great, Pastor. thank you very much and and i can say with thanksgiving that i was in a situation uh, years ago that i gave him my last i gave him my last ten dollars and 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 started tithing after that <laughs> 
<laughs> and I've been tithing ever since. But anyway, all right. It's a, uh, American culture is at an all time high for mental and emotional disorders. And yet God clearly gives us the cause and effect nature of worshiping him and a person's emotional well-being. What is one way this solution step, excuse me, what is one way this solution step to greater mental health could be introduced into culture more clearly? And I think we've been talking about, I think you, by, by bringing up the biblical examples, by bringing up personal examples, it's the heart matter, going back to what Sister Birdie said. It's what's in your heart. And if your heart is genuine, if your heart is authentic and you're just bearing yourself to God in whatever state you have, with whatever possessions you have or with whatever possessions you don't have, if you have a heart for God, God will grant you peace. He will grant you strength. He will grant you stability. He will grant you, I believe, everything that you need to make it through the storms of life. It, not, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. And I'm thinking about the people in Texas, thinking about the people in Buffalo, thinking about people who got some bad news about cancer, or et cetera, or who might be evicted. But if you have a heart for God, and you worship him in spirit and in truth, that he'll give you, what is it? Oh, I think Paul wrote, writes, a peace that passes all understanding, that people won't even know. How is he smiling? How is, how is she not going hog nut crazy with all that's going on in his or her life? And we say it's because we have a heart for God. So, 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 and the world needs to see that from us. That, that's what it, the world needs to, the culture needs to see from Christians that it does make a difference for Christ to live in your life. And um, however you tell it by words, by deeds, or by words and deeds, that's our job to show the world. So number three, worshiping God authentically requires intentionally, intentionality and surrender to his prescribed ways. It also produces visible changes in a person's countenance and emotional well-being. Worshiping God authentically may involve sacrificing the very best we have to offer. But in all of these experiences, worshiping him, worshiping God, raises people up so they can live a, as a kingdom hero. How? By causing them to be more spiritually and emotionally mature, which is then manifested or made clear in daily character traits. Listed below are five character qualities that mark a kingdom hero in today's world, along with a correlating scripture. Identify an opposite or opposing emotion or quality for each one, then write in the blank. So the first one is helpfulness, Romans 15, one and two. We are strong, we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. So what is the opposite? What is one word opposite of helpfulness? One word hindrance. opposite? Hindrance. Selfishness. Selfishness. Selfishness, hindrance, being a hindrance. Okay, that's good. Okay. The next word quality is consistency. First Corinthians 15, 8, 50, 15, 58. My beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abound in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So what is the opposite word for consistency? I put being wishy-washy. <laughs> I was going to put haphazard. Haphazard, that's right. 
Yeah. Uh, I, I put pastor on dependability. On the, yes, on dependability. That's right. People can't depend on it. Good. All right. The next quality is relational commitment. Relational commitment. It, it's from 2 Kings 2.2. 2. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went to Bethel. So Elijah was committed to Elijah. I'm not going to let you out of my presence. What is an opposite of relational commitment? Unengaged or uncommitted. Yes, yes, ma'am. In, in other words, thank you. In other words. Selfishness. Selfishness. And I put also isolation. You, you, you live off to yourself. The next word is courage. De 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 Deuteronomy 31, six, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. So what is a, that's an easy one. What's the opposite of being courageous? Fearful and worried. Uh-huh. Doubt. What do you say? Doubt. Yeah, doubt. Doubt. Mm -hmm. Or cowardly. Yeah. Yeah. Coward, being a coward, being fearful. Okay. The next uh, quality is honesty. Proverbs 12, 22. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal faithfully are his delight. Now, this is an easy one. What's the odd? <laughs> What's the dishonest. Odd? Yes, dishonesty is the opposite of honesty. And it says, which qualities give you more real power to pursue your goals, contentment, and calling? The kingdom heroes' qualities are the opposite qualities. And of course, we know the kingdom qualities give us that because they help us to live a life of authentic, uh, authenticity and genuineness. And, and God promises to reward us when we are genuine. Why do you think very few people draw a connection between their worship of God and their ability to, for, to fully live out the victorious Christian life? even though it's clearly articulated and illustrated in scripture? This is a good question. Uh, we might have to end on that today. Why do you think very few people draw a connection between their worship of God and their ability to fully live out the victorious Christian life, even though it's in the scripture? Why is there a disconnection there? And, and, and I think we do know of believers, of Christians, who are who, who are not living victorious lives. And, and I'm not being judging as being a, a better than one, but I think if we look at some people and they, they are, they're Christians, they're in the church, but they're complaining all the time, they have a negative attitude, uh, they always see the worst in people rather than the best in people, why do you think people don't make that connection? Pastor Karen, I see your hand. So I think it might go back to earlier in the lesson, not today's lesson, but in this worship lesson in general, um, you asked us to rate, the book asked us to rate ourselves as it relates to worship. And I was really amazed at um, uh, everybody's ratings um, but especially since, especially since most of us rated ourselves based on our sitting in a worship service and yeah. how our worship looks while we sit in a worship service. And instead of thinking that we really are supposed to have a lifestyle of worship and that worship should be a part of everything we do in every day, in, in everything. So because we kind of um, relegate worship to a worship service, that's what I do in a worship service. I worship in worship service. I don't see worship um, as I'm washing my clothes. I don't see worship when I'm doing the dishes. I don't see worship 
when I'm doing laundry. And literally a lifestyle of worship means that I worship God in everything that I do. And if we start to think about worship that way, instead of segmenting it into certain aspects of our lives, then the worship of God and God's presence would be um, actualized in everything that we do. But we come part in a lot. We have a tendency, myself included, so don't think I'm talking just about, I'm talking about Karen. We, I have a tendency sometimes to compartmentalize that my worship is what I do on Sunday. And it's really, my worship should be what I do every day, all the time. Good, good, good. Look, if you give me, if, if you can stay on five to seven minutes, I, I think we can finish this lesson because it, it's right at the end. So those who can stay on, stay with us. All right, read Malachi uh, 1, 7 through 10 and reflect on the discussion start as follows. You are presenting defiled food upon my altar, but you say, how have we defiled you? If you say, if that, in that you say, the table of the Lord is to be despised. But when you present a, the blind for sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you present the lame and the sick, is that not evil? Why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased with you? Or would he receive you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? But now will you not entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us? With such an offering on your part, will he receive any of you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were among you who would shut the gates that you might you not usually kindle fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering for you. If you didn't get it, God was upset with the people during Malachi's day bringing imperfect offerings, uh, sick animals, blind animals, and so he was pretty upset about that. So the passage gives us a glimpse of how strongly God feels about the kind of worship we bring him. How do you think people's lives could improve if they started taking the worship of God more seriously. How do you think people, the people's lives would improve if they start taking worship seriously? I, yes, I, I, I think that yes, ma if you ahead. give your best then you'll get the best. So you get yes. what you give. Yes, 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 yes. I put, they would be experiencing abundant life like never before, which would inspire them to fulfill their purpose for authentic worship in the Lord. The next question, why is it important to realize the connection between how you worship God and realities you face in everyday life? I want to repeat that again. Why is it important to realize the connection between how you worship God and the realities you face in your everyday life? That's a deep question. Why is it important that you see there's a connection? Deacon Ellis, you want to share that? Sure, Pastor. And everything that I like to refer to is, has to do with scripture. Yes. Oh, and scripture. They were talking about everyday life, not just our, our life. Things were happening to them in everyday life. And the prophets were saying, if you would only listen to my commands and or follow the commandments that have been given to you, that whole thing translates to, to right, right now. If, if we start thinking that you have some, some type of problems that are clearly irrelevant to anything that they didn't have before. Mm -hmm. you're, you're sadly mistaken. My mother used to always say, there's nothing new that's not in the Bible. Okay. So what makes us think that the problems that we got today are brand new problems, so we, we need to treat them a different way. Yeah, thank you very much. And it's ironic because uh, Pastor Karen and I and, and Pastor uh, uh, McGilvery and Pastor Pierce 
attended a, a black church essentials, a black pastor's church, a black church pastor's essential conference in the Bay Area, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And for the first time in America, Americans being committed to church has dropped under 50%. So not just, so, 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 so commitment to church, which includes worship, worshiping communally, worshiping privately, but commitment to church is on the decline in the United States. It's on a steady decline. Um, it has never been under 50%. It's now in the 40s range. So um, a lot of us aren't getting the whole God connection and the whole worshiping in spirit and truth connection. I know some of you may say, well, they need worshiping God in another way, but but I don't think you can disconnect Christianity from communal congregational worship because it, it, it started that way. And Jesus tells us to do that. So, uh, the answer, yes, ma'am. I've always heard, and I, I really believe that obedience is the truest form of worship. Yeah. And when we get carried away with the Sunday morning corporate worship, and that, that's all there is to it, that's when we, our lives fall apart because we are not obedient to God's word. Obedience, if you, if you truly believe that God is who he says he is, then you have no option but to obey him. Sure. Now, this worship can be an external thing. Sure. But obedience is, a, is, is an uh, internal thing. You decide. I'm going to follow and I'm going to obey. So we have to just think about what worship really means. Obedience sure. is the truest form of worship. Sure, sure. Yes, yes. And as far as my answer to that question of why is it important to realize the connection between high worship God and, re and reality that we face daily is a, that authentic worship is emancipated. It sets us free from the bondage of the burdens of life. It doesn't make us ignore them but it doesn't allow them to, to keep us in bondage. We, we have a way to work through it. What often, what often happens when we seek to worship according to our own level of interest or standards? I'll answer that for us. We miss out on what the Lord has to offer us as well as going to the next level in authentic worship. When we only have our own step, okay, I'm gonna, Say the, the 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 scale of worship is one to ten. Well, I'm going to seven. I ain't going to eight, nine, and ten. I'm satisfied with going to seven. And all all I think I'm saying here is that when we limit how we're going to worship authentically, we limit how much God can really bless us and open us up. The final question is Malachi one seven through ten makes the connection between what a person is willing to bring their governor and what we're willing to bring to God. In today's culture, this may be compared to what people are willing to give to themselves versus what they're willing to give to God. Based on these verses, describe how putting yourself first in your efforts, offerings, and purchases, purchases is counterintuitive to the goal of positioning yourself for personal growth and impact. I'll read that again. Based on these verses, describe how putting yourself first in your efforts, offerings, and purchases is counterintuitive to the goal of positioning yourself for personal growth and impact. Who will close us out with an answer on that? Pastor, I mean, it's, it's everything that we've been talking about. Worshiping God means that you put God first. And when you put yourself first, it is in complete contradiction to what worship is. <laughs> and the truth is, when you put yourself first, you're really worshiping yourself. And so you're on a slippery slope uh, that is bound to no place good. <laughs> so we got to worship. We really got to put God first. It, it's counterintuitive when we don't put God first. It sounds like Deacon Ellis is going to have the last word. No. Oh, well, Pastor Karen, um... My, my old trustee is coming out in me. Uh, so I would go stay right there in Malachi and say, would you be a robber? Would you rob God? 
And he says, how am I robbing God? In tithes and in offerings. So uh, I think that that's pretty much sums that up. All right. Thank you. It says, as you end this study today, pray together for a greater understanding of how worshiping God according to his prescribed ways actually empowers us in our everyday lives. Ask God for the wisdom and maturity to learn how to worship him according to what pleases him rather than what pleases us or signals virtue to others. Talk about ways that you can encourage or remind each other to worship God more genuinely as part of your daily lives. And Sister Birdie, believe it or not, the next session is titled Obedience. <laughs> so, so we're, we're going to end right, where, we're going to begin right where you said we need to end on worship. Yeah, the best way to worship is obedience. So remember that there are, there are some, 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 some lessons you can do. I mean, some, some devotions you can do between worship. If you have the book, it says on your own between sessions. So next week we'll begin with obedience. Uh, as we get ready to close and pray, and thank you for giving us the extra 15 minutes. I, I extended by eight. Uh, let us remember our praying and fasting focus is for the U.S. Senate to pass gun control legislation this year. I went on the websites of Senator Kelly and Senator Sinema, I, and I, I wrote this simple sentence. Senator Kelly, Senator Sinema, please lead the U.S. Senate in passing common sense gun legislation now. That's all I wrote. I got a response already back from Senator Kelly. I haven't heard back from Sinema. And for those of you who don't do internet, I'm going to give you the number. All you got to do is call a number. Sometimes it's just a recording and say, I want you to <clears throat> pass gun control legislation. Senator Mark Kelly's number is 602-671-7901. That, again, it is 602-671-7901. Senator Kirsten Sinema's office number in Phoenix is 602-598. 7327 602-598-7327. They are believing they're, they're a group of Republican Democratic senators that have been meeting and, and we are believing in faith that this will be the time that they can get to a compromise and pass something within the next two weeks. So uh my, it. yes, ma'am. Please, uh, it's just on my heart. There's a long uh, article in the pa in science paper about the number of, of evictions in Phoenix. People are being evicted uh, because they just cannot pay the exorbitant rent. And please, Pastor, pray for those people, uh, especially the ones with children who might even lose their children to the system if they don't find a home for them. So I, I'm asking everyone that put that on their prayer list, continue to pray for this situation of, of homelessness or yeah. due to evictions, people who are working jobs and just can't make enough money to pay this kind of rent that keeps going up higher and higher. Thank you. I've been talking to the mayor and the city council person in District 8 about that piece of property next to the Broadway house been vacant for 45 years since I've been here about building affordable housing there. They've been giving me the runaround for over a year and a half now. And I don't know how they can do that with the crisis that we have. I mean, we have an affordable housing crisis and that property and sister targeting, it knows even before I came, it was vacant, but that property had been vacant for 45 years other than a couple of small stores. And I went to the mayor, I went to Councilman Garcia, right after Councilman Good died, I said, why don't we, build affordable housing and name it after Calvin Good since that's what he fought for on that property that's been vacant for 45 years. Next to the Broadway. And they have given me the runaround. They, uh, and, and they we're in a crisis. But anyway, that's the end of that. So pray. Uh, Deacon Geraldine Lass is having surgery today at Chandler Regional. She hopes to stay maybe overnight or outpatient. Sister Irene Bradley send us an email. She's having health challenges. Pray for her. Uh, uh, and we pray for all of those who are dealing with uh, crises, whether affordable housing, being evicted, gun violence, uh, just health challenges. Sister Maxine Jack, Sister Sharice Jackson, 
bereave uh, brother Robert George lost his 26 year old son. He, I found out he had an epileptic seizure and died. And then brother Nani Katoglos in Africa for his brother's funeral. Any other prayer requests? Um, brother Roderick sent me a request. Um, he said if we would pray for the family of the 80 year old grandmother who was gunned down in New Orleans oh. after attending her grandson's high school graduation. I didn't know about that. Lord have mercy. Anyone else? Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you for this awesome Bible study that connected authentic worship with our everyday lives. Maybe that's why even after we go through our times of grief and, and pain, that we come out of it and we come out of it stronger. We come out of it knowing that you're still in control. Whereas people who don't know you may never come out of it or they choose negative ways to come out of it or they just have no faith and trust in you. So we thank you, God. We are examples. Everybody in this Bible are examples of how no matter what life throws at us, the, the very fact that we try to worship you in spirit and in truth authentically, we're still here. We, we, we have our uh, right mind and we can help others as they go through it. Now we lift up all those names that we call the people who are dying from violence. We lift up those who are having health challenges. Uh, we lift up those who are being evicted. Uh, we just lift up our name. We pray for the Senate. There seems to be a, a glimmer of hope that we might do something about gun violence. We pray that we will pray and do what we need to do. We love you, Lord. We thank you. Thank you for accepting our worship, even when, when it is not up to par. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great rest of the week. I love you all.